أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم من الضالين آمين صدق الله العظيم <تصفيق> Alhamdulillah, with the great blessing of the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is our second class um, concerning the Islam 101. Uh, we are mainly focusing on the fundamentals of faith. In the last week, in the last session, we talked about the importance of learning and how um, this whole process of learning took place from the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. <clears throat> Keeping that in mind, that one of the most effective way of learning which was introduced to the whole ummah through the Prophet ﷺ was learning through someone, individuals. If we were to see the first revelation of the Qur'an, which was revealed after the Prophet ﷺ received his prophethood. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He sent Angel Jibra'il to convey to the Prophet ﷺ that now he is going to be the messenger of Allah. And now he is going to take the message that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send. Now, there were two procedures that took place how the Prophet ﷺ would be receiving this revelation. The first procedure was the cleanliness or the cleansing of the heart, which is known in the terminology of the seerah as shaq sadr meaning the opening of the heart, the opening of the chest. Because the Qur'an was being revealed to the heart of the Prophet ﷺ. As Allah mentions, ala qalbika, we reveal the revelation to your heart. So now, revealing the revelation to the heart required that the heart could be capable of receiving this revelation. Because if the heart is not capable, then the revelation would not be able to be received by the Prophet ﷺ. To explain that into our terminology and understanding, into any vessel you want to put something, you have to make sure that before you actually put something into that vessel, it has to be clean, it has to be enough to receive whatever you're trying to pour in it. So if you have two glasses going into one glass, it won't fit. Right? You have two glasses of water and you're trying to pour it into one glass, it's not going to fit. Similarly, if the glass is dirty, whatever goes inside becomes filthy. Correct? Now, the Prophet ﷺ, when he went through this cleansing process, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removed all the filth that is found in any heart. So he's able to receive it. And then after that has the capability of receiving it. So this is why one of the most effective way of learning is through the process of trans transition that goes from heart to heart. So when Jibra'il came with the revelation and he told Prophet Muhammad, read, the Prophet ﷺ replied, Ma ana biqari'in, I don't know how to read. I cannot read. So Jibra'il, he hugged the Prophet ﷺ and then after that he repeated his order again and the Prophet ﷺ said, I'm not able to do. So this transition happened multiple times 
And then after that, the revelation was given of the Surah Al-Alaq, uh, which is uh, the first five verses, which was the first revelation. And then from there onwards, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he would teach the Sahaba, when he would teach his companion, it will be the same method, right? It will never be the method of just learning it without a teacher, without someone. This is why if you were to look into the books of narrations, the books of ahadith, that every person who narrates the hadith, he is or she is narrating from an individual. Never from something, always from someone. Okay? That's why in the revelation you have Revelation being revealed from this person to this person, or the hadith being narrated by from this person to this person, and then it carries on. So, the element, the, the main purpose of learning is not just to learn the words, but it's to implement them into heart, and that will be transmitted. So when we learn from someone, we're not just learning the words, but also that knowledge is transmitting from one person to another person. It's going through. So it's like a, a visual connection uh, that, you know, that you see. It's like a virtual connection that, that happens that you're not able to see. But that connection is being created. Imam Malik alayhi, mentions that once he saw in his dream that when he was teaching the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, and there were lights that were connecting to all the students from Imam Malik who he was teaching where he actually understood that how the chain of narration works that how the knowledge goes from one person to another person so the first topic that today we're going to start on is what is Surah Al-Fatiha Al-Fatiha the word Fatiha is from the Arabic word called Fataha which means to open Fatih means the opener. Also the word Fatih is used for the conqueror, the person who conquers them something. Now, this first surah of the Qur'an, although it's located in the beginning of the Qur'an, but actually it's the seventh uh, surah. Uh, um, this surah is the... Uh, the the fifth, according to some narrations, is the fifth surah that has been revealed, meaning from the sequence of the other surahs. Now the first question is, why this surah has been mentioned or has been located in the beginning of the Qur'an? Right, that's the first question. What's the significance of the surah? The virtue, Okay. So as we go through this presentation, some of the things that would be answered as we have put the questions in front, that this surah being located in the beginning of the Qur'an, because Qur'an was revealed in the time, in, in, in 23 years of period, from the time the Prophet ﷺ received his first revelation, until he left from this world, this was the whole time the Qur'an was being revealed. Qur'an was revealed twice, First time from the the sacred scriptures of Allah Azza wa Jal, the sacred uh, place of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, which is known as Law al Mahfuz, to the sky, and then after that, Angel Jibrail brought it down as it was needed from the time in in giving uh, instructions to the people. So now, um, Surah Al Fatiha. Was the first surah which is located? So the the, the yes. Um, so how far after? When was the last surah revealed, and how far long after that did the prophet? Well, according to the most authentic narration, the last surah that was revealed was uh, Surah Al-Nasr, "Ida Jaa Nasrullahi Wal Fath." That was the last surah that was revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and this was. According to one narration, 60 days, and according to another narration, 90 days before the demise of the Prophet. 
So it was about 60 to 90 days before the Prophet ﷺ passed away. This was the last of the revelation. Um, now, whenever Jibra'il would come with an ayah or a surah of the Qur'an, he would also tell the Prophet that this surah or this verse will go into this surah after this surah. So the sequence of the Qur'an that we have in front is the exact sequence which is being captured by Allah in Lawa Mahfuz. Because the sequence of the Qur'an are two types. One is the sequence of revelation and the second is the sequence of the book, of the Qur'an itself. So the sequence of revelation is Surah Al-Alaq being the first one, Surah Al-Muzammil being the second one, Surah Al-Muddathir being the third one, and then a few ayats here and there, and then Surah Al-Fatiha being revealed. Okay? Whereas the sequence of the Qur'an itself is Fatiha, Baqarah, Al-Imran, Ma'ida, uh, Nisa, these are the se- surahs, that's the sequence of, of the Qur'an. Now why the Qur'an was not kept in the sequence that it was revealed, and why was it kept in the sequence that we have today? Right? Why did it have to change the sequence? The simple answer to that is, the sequence is not changed. Because the actual Qur'an is in the same sequence that we have today. It was just for the matter of revelation, the sequence changed because of the time and need. So whenever there was a need of something, Allah Azza wa Jal would tell Injil Jibra'il to send this portion. And then there was a need of this, so this portion is being sent. Right? So basically the Qur'an, what we have from Fatiha to Nas, was exactly the same. However, whenever it was being revealed, it will go be piece by piece, according to the need. Because the purpose was to fulfill the need at that time. Correct? So that's why it was taken out of the sequences of the book and sent in the sequence that it was needed, in the, in the purpose that it was needed to fulfill that purpose. However, when it was complete, it was completed into the format that it was originally made by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is from Fatiha to Nas that we have in front. Okay? So... That's how the sequence of the Qur'an was, was, was made. Now this, 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 the whole method of Qur'an being compiled by the companion of the Prophet Wasallam and the revelation and those people who were there at the time of the Prophet when they used to write, uh, when the Qur'an was being revealed. Because Qur'an was not just the Prophet said it, after that people learned it or they wrote it and then it was the done deal. No. It went through multiple times of uh, verifications before it actually got fully compiled. So the first verification was when Jibra'il would give it to the, when he, was, he would reveal it to the Prophet, the Prophet would check it with Jibra'il that whatever he has learned or whatever he has revealed is exactly the same. And then after that, the Prophet ﷺ would make, make someone write it down. And then after that, we people will start learning it. And then later on in the time of Abu Bakr anhu, when they decided to compile the Qur'an, multiple sequences were used, right? The first sequence was that the people who, were, who have memorized the Qur'an, they are going to start writing it from their memory. And then whoever has ayats written down, they will all bring it. And those ayats will be cross-checked by other people's memory who have memorized the Qur'an during the time of the Prophet Wasallam before it actually becomes captured in the book. Yes? So, why when um, Ali was in charge, why did he recite, say that you should recite in the order of revelation? Um, is it, are there people around today in the ulama that believe that we should recite it that way? Well, there is no harm in reciting in the order that it was revealed, mm-hmm. not the order that is being, uh, you know, right. But the majority of the ummah agrees on the Quran should be recited in the sequence that it was, uh, that it is, me- it, it, it is captured, not in the sequence that it was revealed, because the revelation can differ, 
right? Some of them say this verse has been revealed this time and this verse has been revealed that time, right? So for example, Surah Al-Fatiha, some of the commentators of the Qur'an even write that Surah Al-Fatiha was the first of revelation, right? Where majority of the commentators say, no, it was not the first of revelation. Alaq was the first of revelation. So when you go into reciting it on the sequence of revelation, you're going to have a problem with a lot of uh, differences of opinion. How are we going to follow it? When you recite it in the sequence that has been compiled and it's been, it's, it's been uh, captured, then you have no problem because it was already captured in that way from the time of the Prophet wasallam. So that's why they say the tartib of the Qur'an, the sequence of the Qur'an is the way that you're supposed to be reciting it. Right? If someone wants to recite it on the way it was revealed, first of all, I don't even think there are any mushafs available that has the sequence of revelation itself, right? Um, so if you are going to do it, you'll have to kind of rely on whatever information you have in regards to the surahs that were revealed. That's why if you were to look into um, the Qur'an itself, uh, they have two things. Um, Okay. So I'll show you right here. This is Surah Al Fatiha. Okay. Now, over here it says one, and over here it says five. Okay. In Arabic, it says one here, it says five here. This one means this is the first surah in the sequence of the Quran. This five means this is the fifth surah in the revelation of the Quran in the revelation of this surah. So this surah was number five when it came to revelation. Yes. Huh? Majority of them do have that. Yes. You probably didn't notice it because you, and you probably did notice it, but you didn't know what it meant, right? <laughs> so the Qur'ans have that. You know, they have a number right next to the surah and they have a number right after the surah. So the one before that is telling you the sequence of the surah. And the one that is after the surah tells you that this is the sequence of the revelation. That this surah has been revealed. This is the fifth surah to be revealed or the, or the fourth or however. So if you go to, for example, if you go to uh, next surah, Surah Al-Baqarah, you'll see right here, um, you see it says 2 and then it says um, 87, right? So 87 is the revelation and two is the sequence of the Qur'an, right? So, and, and that's how it goes. So those revelations have been captured also. <coughs> so, so that's how the sequence goes, okay? Now, let's go into our presentation. Okay, definition. Qur'an, what, what, what is the meaning of Qur'an? Qur'an means continuous reading. Qara is from the root word called Qara, which means to read. And Qur'an is something that should be read again and again, continuous reading. So, even when you recite the whole Qur'an, you should start it again. Because it's the whole purpose of Qur'an is to be recited again and again. Okay, The Qur'an has many words that have been used for Qur'an, right? It, it's it's for Al-Furqan also. The book that differentiates between right and wrong. Quran is also mentioned as dhikr, a reminder. Okay, Inna nahnu nazzalna dhikr. Allah says we have the one that are revealed, the dhikr, the reminder. Wa inna lahu lhafidun, and we are going to protect it. So Quran is also mentioned as a, as a as a reminder, and al kitab. It's also been al mushaf. These are all different names that has been used for the Quran. Surah. Various meaning in the Arabic language. Surah Al-Jama'ah means collective things. Surat means uh, something very high, distinguished, visible, display, a noble word from Allah. Um, so these are the meanings of surah, high. Also a surah means the wall, right? And all of these meanings can be used in the word surah. The first meaning is Collective things. A surah has collective information. Okay, surah also means something very high, meaning 
These these are high high words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Surah also means the wa, meaning one surah to the next surah, it differentiates. What's the purpose of wa? Is to say that this is one room and that's another room. So the surah means that this is a different surah and that's a different surah. Suratul Kulli Tamam means collective complete. Also part of things. So in the in the Islamic definition of surah is many ayats of the Quran has has a beginning and has an end. So that's what surah basically means uh, in the in the Quranic form, format. <clears throat> ayah, the word ayah that we use verse in the in the in English language verse of the Quran. Ayah comes from the word root word called ayaya, which means signs and miracles. Okay. Now, ayah is not just, it has many meanings to it. Signs, miracles, unique. Uh, the one saying the truth, uh, ayatul jama'ah means groups. Ayah means things that will motivate you. This is also an ayah. Allah says in many places, in fi thalika la ayah. In this, there are signs. Okay? Ayah basically refers to Something that indicates you towards something. Something that shows you the path of something, right? That's what ayah refers to, right? In the Quranic format, part of the word of Allah has a beginning and has an end. It's called an ayah. So it starts, it finishes, it's one verse, it's considered an ayah, right? And all of those collective meaning of the word ayah can be used in the Qur'an's verses. How? Because each verse of the Qur'an has a sign, it's a miracle, it's a unique thing, right? So Allah Azza wa Jal mentions in the Qur'an that in the, uh, those people who deny the Qur'an, if they were to only bring one ayah which is similar to the Qur'an, if they think that this Qur'an was made by a human and was not sent by God. Okay? So, ayah refers to many things in all of that, and this is why each verse of the Qur'an is called ayah, because it has the purpose of being a miracle, it has a, a, a strength of being a sign of Allah, it ha- it's a very unique uh, revelation, and at the same time, it's a whole verse which has a beginning and it has an end. Okay? So that's the definition of an ayah that we say ayah. Like for example, Surah Fatiha has seven ayat. Right? Surah Fatiha has seven ayat. So these are seven verses of Surah Al-Fatiha. Okay. Now, before we actually go into Surah Al-Fatiha, First and foremost thing we need to understand is whenever we recite the Qur'an, we have to start with A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Al-Rajim. Why? Because Allah says in the Qur'an, whenever you recite the Qur'an, recite, say that you ask protection of Allah against the devil. Why do we recite A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Al-Rajim in the beginning of the Qur'an? Right? Because according to our understanding, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Al-Rajim is to take your mind away from the devil. Correct? Or devil is inspiring you to do something and you say Audhu Billah. The Prophet said whenever one of you get angry, say Audhu Billah min shaitan al-Rajim. Okay? But over here you're trying to do something good. So why are you saying Audhu Billah min shaitan al-Rajim? Because when you are trying to do something good, in that goodness, shaitan can get become involved and take out bad influences for you. So Qur'an can be the means of guidance and Qur'an can also become the means of misguiding. How does it become the means of misguiding people? When a person he is not able to understand it properly, so because of understanding one thing, he understands something else. Right? So for example, and this example I gave it in the Tuesday class, we were talking about uh, verse number 184 in Surah Al-Baqarah, where it talks about uh, the consequences of, of defending yourself at the time of war. Okay, 
So the verse is, وَاقْتُلُوهُمْ حَيْثُ ثَقِفْتُمُوهُمْ Allah says, wherever you find them, you kill them. Right? That's the verse. So at that time I had explained that if you were to just take this, it's not even a whole verse, because the verse continues. Um, but if you were to only take this out of context, and apply it, as many people do, and they start killing innocent people, this Qur'an became as a source of misguiding them instead of guiding them. Okay? So that's why you have to seek protection against shaitan, because he can misguide you and take out wrong meanings from the, from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? So when you say, A'udhu billahi minish shaitan al-rajeem, you're asking Allah that, Oh Allah, protect me from shaitan who is accursed. And shaitan was cursed by Allah because of the reason that he did not obey the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. The next verse, the next portion that we recite before we start the Qur'an is, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Now, A'udhu Billahi Minish Shaitan ar-Rajim cannot be used in any other recitation except for Qur'an. So if you're reciting hadith, or if you're reciting a book, or if you're reading something from the book, even an Islamic book, you would not say, A'udhu Billahi Minish Shaitan ar-Rajim. You can say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim and that's fine. That's, you know, that's a good thing to do. And we'll get to that. But A'udhu Billahi Minish Shaitan ar-Rajim is only confined to the recitation of Qur'an or its use for other purposes. But when it comes to reciting or reading something, you're going to confine A'udhu Billahi Minish Shaitan ar-Rajim only to the recitation of Qur'an. The next portion is Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Bismillah means Bismillah means the word ba. The word the 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 letter ba, the letter ba in in Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. It has three meanings. Okay? The letter ba has three meanings. Which refers to number 1 is companionship. Musahabat, connection, companionship. The second meaning is isti'ana, help. And the third meaning is blessings. Okay? So when you say Bismillah, the word Ba has three meanings. The letter Ba has three meanings. Is means name. Allah means Allah. Okay? So, as I was describing, mentioning that the word Bismillah means, so there is another verb that is hidden inside, meaning I start. So I start with the companionship of Allah, I start with the help of Allah, and I start with the blessings of the name of Allah Azza wa Jal. Okay? So when you say Bismillah, all of these three meanings are being taking place. Now, Bismillah is something which is to be mentioned before any type, any type of good things that you do. Okay? The Prophet ﷺ said, any action that is started with Bismillah comes to an end. It has a completion. Right? And any action which is started without a Bismillah, it stays incomplete. Okay, stays incomplete, or it doesn't get done as smooth as it's supposed to get done. Okay, so that's why in anything that you do, try this, and you will see that by saying Bismillah, it will become easy. Even as a small is opening the door, right? Sometimes you're putting your keys inside the door. To open the lock and it's not opening. And you say Bismillah and then you put it in and it opens. You gotta make sure the keys are right. Okay, you can't say, I'm going to say Bismillah never open with the wrong key. You can't do that, okay? You gotta use the right key and say Bismillah and open it. Sometimes it gets jammed, sometimes it gets stuck. You know, many things can happen. So Bismillah is basically, I am seeking Allah's help. 
I'm seeking Allah's blessings and I am taking, I'm asking Allah to be with me in this work. Okay? So the Prophet ﷺ said, كُلُّ أَمْرٍ ذِي بَادٍ لَمْ يَبْدَأْ بِبِسْمِ اللَّهِ فَهُوَ أَقْطَعْ Any good action which is not started with Bismillah, it remains incomplete. It remains incomplete. So to complete any action, it started with Bismillah. And that's why you have Bismillah in the beginning of each surah, because it's in starting of a new surah. Okay. Ar-Rahman means the merciful. Ar-Rahim means the compassionate. And sometimes they translate Ar-Rahman as compassionate and Ar-Rahim as merciful. Okay? So both are used. It's basically the same meaning. But what's the difference between Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim? Ar-Rahman means the one who favors you that no one can ever favor you with those things. The being who is favoring you with things that no one has the capability of favoring you. Ar-Rahim means the one who is giving you mercy, who is favoring you, even though other people have the capability of favoring you. So what does that seem? That Ar-Rahman can only be used for Allah. Ar-Rahim can be used for Allah and other people also. So a person, he is merciful to you. He is kind to you. He is nice to you. You're going to say he's a very kind person. Or he's a very compassionate person. Or he's a very merciful person, right? So in the Arabic language, you will use the word Ar-Rahim for him. You will not use the word, word Ar-Rahman for him. Because Ar-Rahman is exclusively for Allah. It's only for that type of mercy which the humans do not have the capability or the capacity to give. Like bringing human beings from inception. Causing your body to function. Providing you with oxygen. Causing your heart to pump. Circulate the blood through your body. Giving you the ability to think, giving you the ability to see, giving you the ability to hear, giving you the ability to speak. These are all the gifts of Ar-Rahman. One of the problems that the people of Mecca had, that they would consider Ar-Rahman to be a different word. They would say, we recognize who Allah is, but we don't recognize who this Rahman is. Where did you bring a new person from? Or new God from? Right? So Allah revealed the verse in the Quran, قُلِدْعُ اللَّهَ أَوِدْعُ Rahman. Either you say Allah or you say Rahman is the same being. Right? Allah says, Allah Azza wa Jal, He's been described by His attributes, by His qualities. Correct? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has 99 names which are also the qualities of Allah. Okay? They're not just His names, they're also His attributes. So to recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Allah is the only being who can have two attributes or multiple attributes at the same time. Where human beings are only having certain attributes at one given time. Right? So for example, you can be giving and not giving. Either you can give or you cannot give. Okay? You can't have both at the same time. But Allah can have both of them at the same time. So human being, they're restricted. Right? Allah Azza wa Jal is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's a, he's a creator. So he has, Rahman is one of the most merciful names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In comparison to Rahim, Rahim can only be used, uh, it can also be used for a human being. Where Allah Himself uses in the Quran for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Surah number 9, the last verse, Allah says, 
لقد جاءكم رسول من أنفسكم عزيز عليه ما عنتم حريص عليكم بالمؤمنين رؤوف الرحيم that Allah has sent you a prophet who is uh, very merciful to the believers. Rahim, the word has been used for the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So these are two attributes of Allah subhanahu wa taala, which delivers the same translation of the meaning, but they both have different purpose being fulfilled. Because Allah is not going to repeat Himself without a reason. Correct. This is why Ar Rahman fulfills a different purpose and different types of the mercy of Allah, whereas Ar-Rahim provides a different understanding and it gives a different types of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Okay? It took me 15 minutes just to explain how great Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim is. Imam Ali radiallahu anhu says, if I was to do the tafsir of Bismillah, it will take me a whole night. Just the explanation of Bismillah will take a whole night because Bismillah is so impact with great things inside, right? It has many, many components to it, right? So I'm not going to go into those details because it will take, you know, Imam, um, in Madarij al Salikin, uh, the Mufassir in Madarij al Salikin has just dedicated 40 pages of the first volume in explaining what Bismillah is. Right? Just 40 pages of his book just been explained in, in, in Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim in, you know, in different ways, right? So, the Qur'an knowledge is very in-depth, right? So, the more you put in your time to it, more Allah Azza wa Jal opens up to you. Okay, so this is Bismillah. Now, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, there is a whole concept uh, amongst the uh, uh, fuqaha, amongst the scholars, amongst the jurists, that is Bismillah, which is located in between the whole surahs, between the two surahs. Are, is that part of the Qur'an or is not part of the Qur'an? Because there is only one Bismillah which is considered to be the part of the Qur'an, and that's in Surah An-Naml, right? Uh, in Surah An-Naml, Allah Azza wa Jal mentions an ayah of the Qur'an, إِنَّهُ مِنْ سُلَيْمَانِ وَإِنَّهُ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ That this letter is from the king of Sul- King Sulaiman, which starts with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So of course, this is a portion of the ayah of the Qur'an, so that's, that Bismillah is considered to be part of the Qur'an. But the Bismillahs that are mentioned or that are located above each surah of the Qur'an, majority of the commentators of the Qur'an say that this is not part of the Qur'an, because Bismillah is not revealed as many times, right? However, it has been mentioned, or it has been put there to give uh, al-fasil bayna suratain. So it's a differentiation between the two surahs. It's a thing, it's a verse that separates one surah from the other surah, okay? So that's what the majority of the Mufassirin say. And that's why the concept of reciting Bismillah, beginning of each surah, when you are starting the recitation of the Qur'an, in Salah, you have probably heard that some of the people, they recite Bismillah before they actually start the surah, and some of the people don't recite Bismillah when they are leading Salah, right? You probably heard that in different masajids, that when you go, you're praying behind the Imam, and when Imam starts after Fatiha, he starts the next surah, some of the Imams say Bismillah, and some of the Imams say they don't say Bismillah. The whole thing behind this is that those who do say Bismillah, they consider that each Bismillah that is located before the surah is part of the Qur'an. So you gotta recite Bismillah before you start the surah. And those who have the understanding that Bismillah is not part of that Qur'an, it's just a separation verse between the two surahs, they don't recite Bismillah when they start the prayer. Right? How many of you heard that in the, in the masajid? When you go to masjids, some of them, I don't recite it because my opinion is that it's, it's, it's a separator between the two surahs, right? So that's why I don't recite it. Uh, those that don't consider it a separator between the two surahs, they consider it as part of the surah, they do recite it. And both of the opinions are taken by scholars and both of them are correct. There is nothing wrong with any of those practices. 
So this is about Bismillah. Now we're coming down to the first verse of the Quran, of Surah Al-Fatiha. Before we actually go into the first verse, I would like to talk about the virtues of the surah. Allah says in the Quran, وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَاكَ سَبْعًا مِّنَ الْمَثَانِ وَالْقُرْآنِ الْعَظِيمِ We have given you seven verses and the Quran. سَبْعُ الْمَثَانِ means seven verses which are to be recited and the Quran. So Quran and then seven verses. Why the seven verses have been separated from the Quran in this verse? Because this surah is a surah which is only given to the Prophet ﷺ this surah has not been revealed to any other prophet before. The surah Al-Fatiha is only an exclusive gift of the Prophet ﷺ. Okay. There is a narration in, in, in Tafsir al-Tabari that in the early days when the Prophet ﷺ would go to the cave of Hira. And he was having these conversation with Angel Jibra'il. In his multiple times when he was going to cave of Hira or coming back from cave of Hira to his house, he would feel something is following him. But he was so, because in the early days when he received the revelation, he was very frightened. Because he didn't know what was going on with him. It was not something which was very small or very insignificant. It was a very significant thing that had happened in his life. So due to the fear of that, he would not look back to see who is following him. So one day, it happened once. The so first time he felt maybe he's sensing something and there is nothing. But when it happens the second time and the third time, he expressed this feeling to his wife, Khadija radiallahu anha, that you know, when I go to the cave of Hira, I feel that there is someone following me, or there is someone behind me. So Khadija told him, that you know, next time you feel this, stop and look. Confront it. Maybe a lot of time, the fear the best way to get rid of your fear is by confronting it, right? Best way to, right? What a genius woman, mashallah. Mm-hmm. Best way to confront, uh, the best way to get rid of your fear is to confront it, is to go, go after it, right? And that's how you get rid of your fear. So she gave him that idea, and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he was going, he felt the same thing, so he stopped and he looked back. When he looked back, it was Angel Jibra'il. Right, So he asked Angel Jibra'il that why had you been following me? So Angel Jibra'il said, well, I was going to give you a very important message. So he said, okay, but the other messages that you gave me before, they were also equally important. But what's so great about this message? He said, this message needs to be revealed. You need to sense it before you receive it. You need to sense it before you receive it. He said, what is this important thing that you want to give me? So Jibra'il told him that next time, whenever you fear of something, recite Surah Al-Fatiha. And at that time, the Surah Fatiha was revealed. At that time, Surah Fatiha was revealed, right? Because one of the meanings that I mentioned to you of Surah Fatiha was what? A Fatiha, the word Fatih, what does it mean? It means an opener. Also, what does it mean? Conquer. The conqueror, right? So when you recite this surah, you conquer your fear. When you recite this surah, you conquer your fear. And that's what Jibra'il told Prophet wasallam that you will conquer your fear whenever you have fear, recite this surah and you will conquer your fear. Right? So, because he was, I was becoming fearful, right? So he needs to sense that fear, and then after that, he gave him the remedy of that fear. He gave him something which he can confront and, and, and conquer the fear through, inshallah. So we'll continue from there, right? 
It's getting interesting now, right? <laughs>